This is the 14th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Community Breakfast. It was my honor to start this when I first arrived here, and uh, it's been going uh, great ever since. Uh, so we're very happy about this. <clears throat> the important thing is to keep uh, Dr. King's legacy alive. Um, and each year we use uh, this time to focus on the famous quote uh, from uh, Dr. King about having a dream. Uh, that one day uh, his four children would live in a country judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And something I always say uh, uh, every year, uh, because I think it's so important, it fits with our BCC mission to provide access and opportunity and to attack uh, inequality wherever we find it. And uh, something that has always struck me about Dr. King was his letter from the Birmingham jail uh, when other uh, uh, black ministers uh, would criticize him and say, Martin, you're, you're, uh, you're, not, uh, you're making too much noise, you're making too much trouble uh, for us, and, uh, and why, why are you doing this? And he said, because inequality is here in Birmingham, inequality, and he goes wherever he sees inequality, and I think in some small way we should all take that as a as a lesson uh, for our lives, uh, to, to move and eradicate inequality wherever we find it. Uh, and certainly the, the work of uh, Bristol Community College is uh, certainly in that vein. Well, we want to get started. We have a wonderful program for you. Uh, and we want to start out, if we could, uh, with our um, benediction. And that is uh, from our, our, our own, uh, our invocation, rather, sorry, our own uh, uh, Reverend uh, Emmanuel Daphne, Reverend Daphne. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious Lord, we thank you for granting us the opportunity to be here today to commemorate the life and legacy of Dr. King. Lord, what we realize is that without sacrifice, Without toil, without perseverance, no enduring change takes place. And so, Father, it's in that same spirit. We stand here today realizing that while the fight is not yet over, we must continue to persevere. We must continue to press forward to ensure that we see equality reign supreme here in our land. And so, Father, we pray that you bless this day that's set apart in commemoration of your servant so that we, too, might go forth leaving a legacy of service, of sacrifice, and of love to subsequent generations. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Okay, as I mentioned, it is a tradition at BCC to celebrate Dr. King's legacy uh, on this day set aside. Uh, it is appropriate for us to do so because uh, much of what Dr. King held dear is also, uh, those are also principles uh, that guide uh, uh, Bristol Community College. I have a, a saying that we use at the college uh, that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, okay? And uh, the main thing is student success and our teaching and learning. Uh, and the principles of uh, social justice, equality, and opportunity for all. So we do have a, I, I presume, I, I don't want to be presumptuous, <clears throat> but we do have a, a kinship with, uh, with Dr. King. And this breakfast brings together the community to stage this grand celebration. We have invited uh, elect elected officials to attend, and several are here, you'll meet them a, a bit. But while uh, our two U.S. senators and our two uh, local Congress uh, people could not uh, attend this morning, they were kind enough uh, to uh, present us or provide us with uh, videos, uh, video greetings. And uh, we'll start with two this morning uh, from our two uh, senators, uh, Elizabeth Warren. Good morning and happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Thank you to President Spraga for inviting me to join you this year's breakfast. I really wish I could be there with you in person. Martin Luther King left such an important legacy for our country. Today is a chance to celebrate Dr. King's life, reflect on his vision for a more equal society, and embrace his call 
for service to the community. This past August, we marked the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the march when Dr. King shared his dream and called for change. And later this year, we will celebrate 50 years since the Civil Rights Act was passed into law, a landmark moment in the ongoing fight for equality. Five decades after Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech and after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, there's still a lot of work to do to make that dream a reality for all. Today's holiday is a chance to reaffirm our commitment to continuing Dr. King's fight for social justice and our dedication to his belief in the power of service to the community. Thank you for letting me join you in this celebration and this powerful moment of reflection. Good afternoon, Bristol Community College. I am so sorry I can't join you today to celebrate the life and everlasting spirit of Martin Luther King Jr., one of the greatest minds and voices to have ever graced our world. Thank you, President Jack Sprayer, for hosting today's event. And a special thank you to Mayor Will Flanagan uh, for his leadership in representing this community and having a vision of openness and opportunity for everyone uh, in his community, in our community, and in our country. And thank you to everyone else who is there from the Bristol Community College. Thank you for your leadership, for your energy in ensuring that Bristol Community College is an educational epicenter of the Fall River community and for the entire state of Massachusetts. I also want to congratulate distinguished African-American alumna Jennifer DeBarros, as well as all of the essay and poster winners. Thank you for sharing your wonderful gifts with us. You make all of us, and especially Bristol Community College, proud. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. Now, as a young boy, my mother used to tell me that she would donate my brain to Harvard Medical School as an example of a completely unused human organ. And she would say that right before she would explain to me that to truly succeed, I needed to work smarter, not harder. Education is a ladder of opportunity. It is an investment in our future. Through education, we invent the materials that power our economy and we initiate the moral discussions that advance a nation. When Martin Luther King Jr. went to graduate school here in Massachusetts, he continued a long tradition of our state advancing these discussions. And so to the students of today, to the students of Bristol Community College, that is your charge, to constantly seek the dawn of new discovery, to shed the sunlight on the injustices of our time to represent the values that Martin Luther King Jr. embodied. Thank you and enjoy celebrating the life of Martin Luther King Jr. And I will continue to stand behind institutions like Bristol Community College to make sure that they are provided with all of the support they need to continue to give Massachusetts students the opportunities they need to maximize their God-given abilities. Thank you all for everything you do to advance the cause of justice in our society. <clears throat> that is really a highlight for our breakfast. And another highlight coming now, it's my honor to introduce our musical group, uh, uh, Living Water. But with Gary Lyon and Living Water, we're coming to bring you some news, which is good news. Um, we, we count it a privilege and an honor to be here another year. Uh, as the president said, we're basically have been coming out here just about every year. I think when it come last year, but we count it a joy to be here each year. So join in with us as we sing, Bless the Lord. to my king I will sing praises to my king he is lord of everything he is lord of everything I will sing praises to my god I will sing praises 
presents to my God. He has set me upon a solid rock. He has set me upon a solid rock. The Lord our God is great, perfect in all his ways. God of mercy and of grace, the Lord our God. The Lord our God is great. Yes, he is. No. 
please take advantage of the events that we have scheduled so far in February. It really is kind of a kickoff to our African American History Month in February, uh, although I always hate to call it that because uh, uh, I'm never crazy about a definitive period of time. That's the only time we can celebrate African American history, the 1st of February to the 28th or 29th of February. It's not a month-long activity. It's a year-long activity that we need to embed in our, uh, in our daily lives. Uh, <clears throat> so um, we're, uh, please do take a look at all of those wonderful events, and you're welcome, of course, um, to attend. Uh, and also, please note in particular that we have a free credit, uh, a free one credit course uh, offering uh, uh, on the Dr. King's readings and his work uh, that will start on Monday evenings. Uh, it's on, on Monday evenings uh, for five weeks, starting in February, February 3rd, and uh, based on, uh, as I say, on Dr. King's uh, on life. It's a free course. Uh, you'll learn more about Dr. King, and I want to thank. Uh, uh, Dr. Ron Weisberger, who has uh, been doing this for some years now, uh, making available his expertise uh, and uh, uh, the facilities at Bristol Community College to extend the uh, great work and inspiration of, of Dr. King. So if you are interested, uh, at least in getting some more information, if not signing up this minute, uh, we'll have a, uh, a desk available here in the corner of the uh, cafeteria for you. And this, org this event today is organized by a committee at BCC that works all year to develop it. Um, and uh, please join me in recognizing this year's committee. First, I want to start with the two co-chairs, uh, Tafa Awalaju and Sally Cameron. We have uh, members Milton Clement, <laughs> Philomeno Pont, Liz McCarthy, Cindy Poor Parasol, Bob Resendiz, Kevin Spurlett, Linda Viveros, and Dr. Ron Weisberger. Would you all stand just to be recognized? Thank you very much. Thank you. Getting up all over the tent, right? Thanks so much. I also, how about that music, uh, not only from Living Waters, but our uh, company in us today. Uh, they have been here, I think, every year that the, of the 14 years that we've started. Please join uh, with me to thank uh, Louis Lima, Lehman and Michael Crowley. Michael and Lee, Louis, they're, maybe they're getting a break today, uh, a break right now while they play. Also, um, it's been a, co a community tradition, this breakfast at, in Greater Fall River, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge some of our community leaders who have joined us uh, this morning. Uh, uh, you've heard from uh, Senator Markey about uh, the wonderful things about Mayor Will Flanagan. We'll be hearing from him sh very shortly, uh, but I do want to acknowledge his presence. And also, uh, I want to mention to you the Reverend Darrell Malden, uh, who, if you would raise your hand, Darrell, there he is. Uh, he is the pastor of Bethel AME uh, ch congregation and church, and uh, they have a community service immediately following this event on Hanover Street at Bethel AME, and we're all invited uh, to attend. Uh, thank you very much, Reverend. Um, how about some of our uh, state representatives who have graced us with their presence? Everybody has a busy schedule today. Uh, Carol Fiola. <laughs> Paul Hero. Paul. Chris Markey, Kiki Oro, Kiki, Paul Schmidt, all right, thank you, Alan Sylvia, Representative Alan Sylvia, and uh, Steve Hewitt, did I call Steve, Steve Hewitt, how it, is right, there he is, okay, good. Uh, we also have Oliver Cipollini, the Governor's Council, uh, Oliver is here, there he is, and his brother. I'm also pleased to recognize uh, our trustees who are here, uh, Chairman uh, Fernando Garcia. There is Chairman Garcia. Trustee Cynthia Rose, Vice Chair. And Trustee Patricia Andre. Patricia, there she is. Other, other office holders, we have uh, Marlene Pollack, the New Bedford School Committee. Professor Marlene Pollack, thank you for coming. <laughs> and Jack Livamenti. Jack is here from the New Bedford School Committee. Also, we have the, uh, uh, Rob Mellion, the CEO of the Greater Fall River Chamber of Commerce. Where is Rob? There he is. Great leader. 
and uh, Lee Charlton, former head of the NAACP. Lee, former keynote speaker at this event. As I mentioned earlier, we're joined in our sponsorship at uh, this breakfast by the city of Fall River, uh, which helps us with a very important part of this event, our annual middle school poster contest. I hope you took the opportunity to see the posters out in the lobby. If not, please uh, check them on the way out. We have teachers and administrators from our various schools here to watch uh, as their students are honored. Uh, Sandra Arnold, a teacher at Cuss Middle School. Sandra, there she is. Thank you, Sandra. Stephanie Baker, also from Cuss Middle School. Stephanie, thank you. Karen Gruga. Karen? Karen? Did I say that correctly, Karen? Gus from Cuss. Linda Cabral from Talbot. Linda? Jackie Arnfeld from the uh, Whitney Academy. And Pam Farrar, also from Whitney Academy. So it's great to see the educators here. What, what greater piece of education than to uh, follow the ideas and the uh, dream of uh, Dr. King. This year, in honor of the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's historic march on Washington, uh, the Board of Trustees at Bristol Community College created an essay competition inviting BCC students to write about the meaning of Dr. King's dreams and ideals. A faculty and staff committee headed by English professor Farah Habib took on the challenging task of choosing the winning entries. And now I would invite the Vice Chair, Trustee Vice Chair, Cynthia Rose, to announce the winners of the essay uh, contest. Cynthia Rose, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Sprager, and thank you all for being here. We love to see all of you folks uh, celebrating this uh, holiday with us, so thank you. In third place, receiving a cash award of $100 is Jamie Gear of New Bedford. Jamie? Second place with a cash award of $150 is Jody Thatcher of South Dartmouth. First place receiving a cash award of $250 is Tyler Patello of Berkeley. Congratulations, Tyler. You can stand over there. Congratulations to all the winners. Now, Tyler will read us his winning essay. Before I get started, I'd like to thank the board, whoever chose my essay. I thought it was all right. I mean, it was an okay essay, but I definitely I'd like to congratulate second and third. Seriously, it's an honor to be up here. <clears throat> what does the I Have a Dream speech mean to me? <clears throat> Perfect. Uh, I still get chills every time I hear the memorable speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in D.C. Just the crackle of the old speakers give me the sense of calmness. I thought that everything will be all right. Even after visiting the Lincoln Memorial this past winter and standing where Dr. King stood years ago speaking about equality in such a peaceful manner, helps me put everything into perspective all over again. I looked over the reflecting pool from where Dr. King stood and just thought about the history that was made in his 17-minute speech, along with the lives that he changed. It's funny how a simple walk up those steps could bring back the words that Dr. King spoke on that hot August day back in 63. 
This work of great linguistics tells me many of the things, many things. <clears throat> one of which is that one person can help solve a problem that has been plaguing this country for hundreds of years. What this work means to me is that anything can be accomplished through, the positivity, through positivity and peace. Dr. King lived as someone who used powerful words and motivation to show our nation that we, what we were doing was inherently evil and wrong through speech and pro, uh, peaceful protests. At no time did he become violent or use his fists to defend his position, which helps me understand the same thing, that the use of words over violence can literally move mountains. Hearing the speech over and over in English classes since grade school has left, me, left a quite an emotional impact on me, and will probably do the same in 20 years when I'm teaching the same thing to my children, that hate is never an option. I would want the same for my children that Dr. King when he said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And what this speech tells me is that there can be an end in sight if you look past all those who are trying to oppose you, along with the fact that peace prevails in the end. The reason why Martin Luther King Jr. is looked at as one of the most important and influential people in this country's history is that he did not lift his fists at all. He simply gave those fighting for a, chance, a change a hand to hold in the struggle for justice. This speech will move me for the rest of my life simply because it gave millions of Americans hope for change and hope that one day their lives could be altered in a positive way and to be given the same opportunities as white Americans. This speech alone highlighted the civil rights campaign of the 60s and will always be remembered as probably the greatest speech in American civil rights history. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for our three winners for the essay contest. Weren't they wonderful? Thank you. I had a chance to read all of the uh, entries, and uh, these three were really spectacular, just terrific. And uh, so it makes us so proud of our BCC student body. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And speaking of our student body, I want to point out our uh, student trustee is also with us, uh, Chris Mitchell. There he is. Chris, <laughs> instrumental in getting this, po this contest started. Thank you, Chris. Uh, now to recognize the poster contest winners, please join me to welcome uh, another of our community partners, the Honorable uh, Will Flanagan, Mayor of City of Fall River, who will bring greetings from the city and announce the winners of the poster contest. The educators and students worked hard on this year's contest, and I encourage you to view the results in the front lobby, as I mentioned. Mayor Will Flanagan, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. President Sprager, thank you very much, and I am truly honored uh, to be able to be back here at Bristol Community College for this annual event. And each year, uh, we get to gather uh, at this campus uh, to remember the words and the actions of Martin Luther King Jr. And to take that message of peace and that message of hope and to continue to preach it in today's day and age. And to see everybody here gather uh, on this beautiful uh, winter's day uh, really is a testament to our community. Uh, but what is most moving for me is to see uh, that our children have also gathered here uh, this morning too. And each year we have the poster contest where the children throughout our middle school, uh, through their artistic capability, express what Martin Luther King Jr. meant to them. And as mayor, I'm always doing my best to bring that message into our public school system especially at a time where it's difficult to be a child, uh, where children are dealing with issues such as conflict and bullyism. It's important that we continue to bring that message of peace and hope and to resolve conflict without violence into our school system. And before I close in my remarks and present the awards to our recipients, I challenge all of you uh, to go out today and to do an act of kindness in the name of Dr. Martin Luther King, to go out today and to make a difference in the lives of others. As King said, the time is always right to do what is right. And I challenge all of you to go out and do that today. So 
It's an honor for me uh, to be able to recognize our winners. Uh, the first winners we will announce are our third place winners, and they will receive a $30 gift card. And the first is Amy Gee of Morton Middle School. Is Amy here with us this morning? Also receiving a $30 gift card is Doth Khan of the Talbot Middle School. Doth? And our last third place winner to receive a $30 gift card is Daryl Bunley of the Talbot Middle School. Daryl? Can we have another round of applause for all of our third place winners? Okay. It now brings us to our second place winners who will receive a $40 gift card. And first I'd like to announce Shaylin Carrero of the Cuss Middle School. Shaylin. teacher will accept on her behalf. <clears throat> and Doa Jamal of the Cuss Middle School. Doa? Another round of applause for our second place winners. And finally, our first place winners uh, who will receive a $50 gift card as well as a gift certificate to attend the Kids College here at Bristol Community College. And first is Ashley Grant of the Cuss Middle School. Ashley. And last but certainly not least is Pedro Silva of the Cuss Middle School. Pedro. If you haven't had the opportunity before you exit today, please uh, take a look at all their artwork. The students, along with their teachers, put so much time and effort into it. And if we can just give them another round of applause, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Flanagan. And uh, 
what a great representation for the quality of uh, students and the quality of our schools in Fall River. And let's give them another round of applause. <clears throat> You can see from the essay uh, contest as well as the poster contest uh, that we have some just terrific talent uh, here at BCC and in the Fall River School System. Uh, the Distinguished African American Alumni Award is presented yearly by the BCC Alumni Association to recognize outstanding achievement. And here to introduce the award is uh, the uh, president of the Alumni Association, Patricia Jeffrey Zakowski, class of. <clears throat> <laughs> class of 2011, I think. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sprager. As has been announced earlier, there is always the perfect time to do something perfect. And today, the Alumni Association and the Foundation, we are a joint entity. We have the privilege of presenting our Alumnus of the Year Award to Jennifer DeBarrows. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for sharing in this very memorable moment. Um, if you can, please, if you've come here to support me as my family, from Third Eye, from Treatment on Demand, from my blood, can you please rise up? Because this is a collective award. I share my successes, and I wouldn't have them without each and every one of you. Stand up. My mother with the camera, my aunt, my children, Kaylee. She's gonna be a graduate here at BCC very soon. My Third Eye family, TOD family, Treatment on Demand, Marlene and Dan, this is ours, and I share this with each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Whew. Okay, so I need to acknowledge the village, and I think a lot of times when we see leadership, we see the individual, we see MLK, we see him as an individual, as a hero, and we separate ourselves. And we don't look at the thousands, of, there were 250,000 people at the March on Washington. That's what made his success. If there were one or two, we wouldn't know who he was. So we have to really look at the people that are around us, the village that supports us, and understanding that we always have what we need, even when we think we have lack. So I just want to acknowledge the village that exists here. And I know each and every one of you are part of a village and are doing the best that you can to support the leadership around you. Um, so. And honoring Martin Luther King, I had to really, I mean, he's an amazing being, <clears throat> a humanitarian, <clears throat> a fighter, a visionary. Um, and I think what, what resonates most with me is his resilience and his resistance. And I think when I look at my story and I look at the journey that I've come through, it's about being resilient. It's about being tenacious. It's about looking at the obstacles as challenges for growth and opportunity, and really having the strength and the perseverance to overcome and do things that are not common, that are unpopular, that are controversial. That's what I look at when I see him and I see me because we are all a reflection of each other. Um, one thing, um, I was talking to a friend of mine last night, and I know a lot of you were on the football frenzy last night, yes? <laughs> Okay, so he was upset that the 49ers had lost. <laughs> and he said um, that the head coach had mentioned, they said, so what do you think about this? And the head coach had said, um, a man can be defeated but never destroyed. So when you look at football, I think everybody, well, I can't identify with it, but a lot of people do, right? Um, you can take this and you can apply it. I think we've all had struggle We've all had barriers and challenges in front of us, and we often feel defeated. We often want to give up, but we can never be destroyed. MLK has never been destroyed. He's still here. His vision is still alive. His words are still strong. 
His presence is still great. Has anyone been to D.C. to see the memorial? The Mountain of Despair? Please go see it. He still stands, and he's in his b-boy stance, and he's looking over, you know, where the powers that be are making policies that are shaping our lives. But he was never destroyed. So we will never be destroyed. We are eternal in what we do. So I'm going to share a little bit about my story um, because I love this place, the G building. This is where we used to hang out and not go to class. No, we went to class. Obviously, right, I graduated, so I did go to class, kids. Um, but I did want to just share how I became here. And there is a little error on my bio that I have to make sure that I, I address. Or oh, not the bio, but the description. Um, so, me. Um, born and raised in New Bedford. My mother had me at 18 years old um, to a Cape Verdean family um, that I identify with in terms of the time and the culture that I was raised in. Um, as time went on in my life, I think, you know, a lot of the things that are going on today are still what were going on in, in my lifetime as well. I was um, a young person that was lost. And there are a lot of young people today that are lost, and I really, really admire every one of you from Cuss, Talbot, Morton. You are all my heroes. And we do programs out there in Far River too, but you are my heroes. You are my future. Because it was at that time in middle school that I started to transition and I started to lose myself, or find myself, I should say. I started a, a transition, as we all do. Parents don't like it. It's the teenage stage. Um, but we start to get confused in who we are and what we're doing and who we're with and we're looking for a sense of belonging and we're looking for something to attach to. And I can say that in that time frame, I made some very critical decisions. I put myself at risk because I didn't understand how to love myself. There wasn't a lot of love around. And it was there, it was just in different forms. Like I had my family, I had supports, and as I got older, I realized everything I needed, I had. But when you're young, you don't really understand it. You see TV and you want the Cosbys as your parents, you know? But how many of us have the Cosbys as our parents? You look at outside of yourself for things that you feel you need when everything you need is really within yourself. So I don't know how much time I have. I'll try to be fast, sorry. Um, but basically, I was a young person that became pregnant at 15 years old. Actually, I gave birth to my son, Treshawn. Can you stand up? He didn't want me to do this, but I'm going <laughs> to. He's the reason for this. Sorry, I know you didn't want me to, but I had to. Um, so if you can imagine being 15 years old and, and bringing life into the world and all the adversities coming at you, all the things that people say to you or think about you, college was never in the, in the, in the vision. It was never in the vision. But I had my son and I was a sophomore in high school when I became pregnant. So I transitioned over to the, tech, the Pregnant and Parent and Teen Program of New Bedford High. And as a student, I did pretty well. I got really good grades, but when I transferred to that school, I didn't really feel inspired by the setting, by the curriculum. I loved that my son was down the hall, but I didn't really feel engaged with my education, so I dropped out my junior year, and I decided that I was going to just get my GED. And when I decided that, I said, if I get my GED, I have to go to college, because how am I going to feed my son? How am I going to get ahead? How am I going to break cycles with a GED? So I made it my force <laughs> to make sure I enrolled. And I was enrolled in BCC before my class even graduated. My class graduated in 94. I was here in 1993 working on my associate's degree. Um, but I, had, I wanted to major in art. My mom's like, you're not going to feed your son off an art degree. And I was like, OK, I will be a medical secretary then. Thought that's where the jobs were. <laughs> so I felt I'll just be a medical secretary. And it's funny how life works and how things come into fruition. So I, I pursued the medical secretary degree, and I was placed as a, at a co-op co in that final stage. 
when you're about to graduate, you do the experiential learning at a job site. And I was placed at Treatment on Demand. And that was a point of transformation where I found the power of people, of community, of leadership, because it helped me to realize that my struggle was everybody's struggle. Like King said, an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. And that's where I became, became me. I became empowered, and that's where I started to love myself. Everything that I had done beforehand was just trying to get ahead and figure things out, but now I started to come into myself, and I realized how important education is. And I found my passion, that it's outside of me. It's about people. It's about those other young people that were just like me. And I can get into everything that I did, but I don't like to focus on that. But there are so many people struggling, I realized I have to give back. So I was placed at Treatment on Demand, and this says uh, Child and Family, but Treatment on Demand was a place that really saw the light and the leadership. There was a beautiful team of people there that really helped shape my worldview. And since then, I found my passion was sociology. So I went back to school and I got my bachelor's degree in sociology at Bethune-Cookman University in Florida with a 3.7, I have to say. Um, I went to school full time and went to, went to work full time and I have a few grace because of it. I think I broke a few vessels in the brain cells, but um, I did it. And I think education is so important for you young people here. Education is really the key and it comes in various forms. But BCC was the launching pad it really, really was, and I am proud of BCC. I am proud of this place because the day I stepped foot on this campus, I was so inspired, like, wow, this is college? High school didn't, I was ready to check out of school. I didn't value education until I came here because the commu it was a community college. It was a community here that supported you and made your goals attainable. You were around a community, you were around professors that were really passionate about what they were doing. I should have came to BCC, then New Bedford High. I should flip it around. But there's a certain stigma with community colleges. And we have to really be proud of this resource. And we have to let our kids know it is a great thing to do, is come to a community college. Like a lot of young people say, oh, I applied to UMass, but I got, I'm going to BCC. <laughs> this is where it's at. We have to really, really change the way we perceive this. Because if it wasn't for this, and I never worked a day in a doctor's office, maybe I will, or maybe in a future life, I don't know. Um, but it linked me to where I am today. Because I would have never walked through the doors of Treatment On Demand. I was going there to help them type minutes and answer the phones. And I ended up leading a youth program, the director of a youth program at 19 years old. And I eventually stepped up to become the director of services of the entire organization and all of its programs at a very young age. But it's seeking, it's seeing that opportunity and harnessing that and really showing up for it. Because I know there are a lot of other people like me that can't stand here today. They cannot stand here today. And it's those people that are the reasons why I stand here today. And it's for you young people, Kaylee, and my children, and all of you, that I stand here today because no matter what, no matter what challenges, no matter what obstacles that you face, I mean, I can go into it. We can go sit and have a conversation about all of the steps and the things that have come into my way and the things I've had to conquer and overcome. We all have them, but it's how we view them and what we do with them. My mentor, Gerald Ribeiro, he always used to say, crisis is opportunity. And it is. It's how we look at it. We can let it destroy us, or we can let it really shape who we are. We can be just like Martin Luther King. And I just wanted to say, just shift a little bit into something that he said, because we focus a lot on the I have a dream speech. 
a little bit too much because he was more than that speech. He was way more than the speech. And one of his quotes is, um, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which reproduces the beggar needs reconstructuring. Do I need to repeat that? True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces the beggar needs restructuring. We can't blame the victims. We have to blame the systems, and we have to change the systems. We have to change the structures that create the conditions, and that is what Martin Luther King was trying to do. And that is why he is not in the physical, because he was fighting really hard to change the structures, the systems in place, and they are still in place today. His dream is still alive. And we have to look, about, look at another thing that he said is, true peace is not the absence of tension. True peace is not the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. We cannot be benefiting off of a system that is not meeting our needs. And if we are benefiting, there's a guilt with that because someone else is not benefiting. So as long as there is no justice, there is no peace. And I, I know that's cliche in the movement, we say it all the time, but true absence is not, I mean, true peace is not absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. And we have to work towards justice. Do you feel the dream, the dream has been accomplished? Is it real? We just lost three people in New Bedford within 24 hours. Is there no longer work to do? Is there? Are we done? Are we done? No. And I think we have to stop looking outside of ourselves. It was the 250,000 people. How many people are here? 250? I'm bad with that. Throw me a number. It's each and, of, each and every one of you that have the power. You are no different than him. You are no different than me at all. So I want to end with this um, because we have to change the vision. What is your vision of today? Change it to a positive vision because King had a vision, and that's what got us this far. We have to completely think of that power we have in creating a vision. What is the vision we want for ourselves? What is the vision we want for our communities? What is the vision we want for our children's futures and their, fu and their children's futures? There's power in how we think and perceive things. We cannot underestimate that. We really have to shape the way this world is going and look at our power within it. So the last thing I want to quote from him is, today our survival depends on our ability to stay awake. Stay awake. So yes, I'm currently the director of Third Eye Youth Empowerment, and the Third Eye is about keeping your mind's eye open. It's about staying awake. These eyes can get tired, they see a lot. But when you open your mind's eye, you see other possibilities. You create a vision for yourself. You solve problems. Um, but I didn't mean to paraphrase his quote. Um, Today our survival depends on our ability to stay awake, keep your third eye open, to adjust to new ideas. As elders, we really need to embrace our young people. We really need to embrace their technology, they're thinking they're at 10,000 light years ahead of us. We cannot be teaching them the way we were teaching people hundreds of years ago. We're struggling in our school systems to keep young people engaged because we're not valuing young people. We need to really value them, embrace new things, to remain vigilant, persistence, dedication, and to face the challenge of change. Change is uncomfortable. Change is difficult, but we have to be resilient. We have to embrace it. We have to go through it. We have to challenge ourselves to embrace change. So at the end of the day, I really thank you for this moment and allowing me to share a piece of me with you. I really hope that at, at least you leave here with a sense of pride in knowing that this college 
is instrumental in the lives of many, 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 many people in helping to reshape our communities in a positive way. And I think ultimately is understanding that there's a power within you, regardless of where you come from, what your background is, what resources you have. There's, we are abundant. We have everything that we need. Change is inevitable, growth is optional. It's all about the choices and how we perceive that. So thank you. I hope I haven't bored you. Um, but really, education is the key, and, and, and I really appreciate this opportunity and acknowledgement. And I'm happy to have everyone here who came out um, to support me and who continue to support me. Thank you. Well, what a wonderful speech. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded of our uh, mission statement at BCC. We change the world by changing lives one learner at a time and learner by learner. And uh, there's a good example of it, a real inspiration to the rest of us. Uh, and as we go to, uh, throughout the year, we go to uh, uh, commencement of, uh, exercises, or, uh, not just the one in June, but every speech is, uh, every uh, story of our students is, uh, equally inspiring, and it's just terrific uh, to hear that. Uh, now it is uh, my uh, privilege uh, once again to uh, bring together uh, our living waters for another musical selection, and then we'll hear from the keynote speaker. Living waters, ladies and gentlemen.
Living waters, ladies and gentlemen, weren't they wonderful? <clears throat> now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Myra Young Armstead, a professor of history and director of Africana Studies at Bard College in New York. She has written a number of books, including Freedom's Gardener, James F. Brown, Horticulture in the Hudson Valley in Antebellum America. Also, Mighty Change, Tall Within, Black Identity in the Hudson Valley, and Lord, please don't take me in August. Uh, all well-received books and uh, a scholar in the field. We're very lucky and honored to have her with us. Please welcome Dr. Myra Young Armstead. Thank you so much. Good morning to you all. Living Waters, I want to tell you I enjoyed you tremendously. And I'm going to try to get you to Bard, if I can. I want to thank the planning committee, first of all. Um, you've shown me great hospitality. And it's wonderful to be back in this area. Uh, many, many years ago when I was doing my dissertation, I actually did a lot of research in Fall River, um, researching the steamship lines. This morning, as we have assembled to commemorate the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., we applaud him as the most widely recognized foot soldier and general in the 20th century United States Civil Rights Movement. Today, we are grateful for his decision to step onto the national platform as the leader of the 1955-56 Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. We acknowledge him as a founding member of the Southern Christian Leadership Council, an organization established in 1957 to mobilize African-American ministers in the political struggle of black people in this nation. We are thankful as we recall him at the head of the countless peaceful protest marches, mostly in the South, for voting rights, for equal access to lunch counters, and a full range of public accommodations. We celebrate King as an articulate and charismatic spokesman for the cause of equality. It is undisputable, undisputable that he was a prophetic visionary, especially when we think of his I Have a Dream speech, and his prediction, literally, on the eve of his assassination, in which he unforgettably said, and I quote this, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. 
I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Because of King's life, three key pieces of federal legislation were passed. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. What I wish to emphasize, especially this morning, is that those progressive national developments would not have taken place had not King risen to the occasion back in 1955, actually 1956, when he experienced a crucial transformative moment. Now we all know the very often told story of how 42-year-old Rosa Parks, a respected but tired black seamstress, on her way home to her equally respected husband, a barber, on a Thursday night, the first day of December 1955, was arrested for refusing to get up from her bus seat for a white passenger. That famously sparked the Montgomery bus boycott that launched King's prominence as a civil rights leader. But what is not as commonly known is that King's command of the boycott, spearheaded by the Montgomery Improvement Association from the start continually through its successful end 11 months later was not a foregone conclusion. Rather, what it required was a transformative moment in Martin Luther King's life. The significance and power of such transformative moments is one of King's most important legacies for us today. When Martin Luther King Jr. first arrived in Montgomery, Alabama to take his first job as a pastor, at the city's Dexter Street Baptist Church in 1955. He was only 26 years old. He had only been married for two years, and he was completing his doctorate. While he attended local NAACP chapter meetings because he did believe that the time had come for change, he declined an offer to become its president when it was extended to him because he was concerned about first fulfilling his duties as a new father, uh, he had just had his first child, and as a brand new pastor. Meanwhile, the black people in his new home city of Montgomery had been preparing themselves for a while for a confrontation they felt was an inevitable with local white authorities over the segregationist bus ridership rules. There had been many, many related scuffles over the years before Rosa Parks. E.D. Nixon, who was a Pullman porter and a member of the black union called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and was the former NAACP chapter leader, was looking for a test case to destroy this system of segregated riding. And there had been a couple of incidents that didn't prove to be suitable. Joanne Robinson, who was head of the Women's Political Caucus, similarly was poised to galvanize her organization, a group of black women, into an anti-segregation campaign. Another black organization called the Alabama Voters League had tried various strategies to increase the number of black registered voters. And there were white sympathizers like Clifton and Virginia Durr, who were members of the Civil Rights Subcommittee of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare. Rosa Parks' act of civil disobedience provided the right test case because she was such a solid and respected citizen that they knew that it would just appear in just egregious and absolutely unsupportable for her to have been arrested. Her arrest allowed all of these forces working and waiting in the wings to come together in a new united front called the Montgomery Improvement Association, which was formed just a few days after her arrest. But the Improvement Association needed a leader. Martin Luther King Jr., the new man in town, was quickly nominated to be the president and spokesman, and he accepted this time. How? And why did this happen? Well, much has been written about this. Some say that E.D. Nixon 
while he was a proven and dedicated activist, was too unschooled and unrefined compared to the far more articulate King. And the movement leaders wanted to present a, a, a very smooth and fluent presence to the public. Others point out that an eager contender for the post, Reverend Elroy Bennett of the city's black interdenominational ministerial allowance had a far too domineering and ineffective leadership style. And this was something that even King noticed, even though he was a newcomer. In fact, King privately suggested to a friend that another man, Rufus Lewis, who was a black Montgomery businessman and a former football coach at the local black college, Alabama State, might be a good leader for the Improvement Association. In the end, we know that King himself accepted the new post, but he did so only because of the unanimous support he received at the organizational meeting and because of his concern that the growing movement might fizzle out and lose popular support with Bennett at its helm. By agreeing to head the Montgomery Improvement Association, King took the first step toward his transformational moment. The boycott gained momentum. Blacks in Montgomery rallied behind the movement to stay off the city's buses. They walked and carpooled to and from work. In some instances, white employers using their privately owned cars drove them back and forth to their homes. And King, as the Montgomery Improvement Association spokesman, gained the spotlight. As a result of gaining the spotlight, opposition forces in the city decided to bear down on him. But in so doing, they only succeeded in bringing King to his transformational moment. It happened in the wee hours of the morning just after midnight on January 27, 1956. To stop the effectiveness of black carpooling, Montgomery's police department embarked on a campaign to arrest black drivers. On January 26, 1956, King left for his home in his car after a day of work at his church office. He stopped to pick up some carpoolers. As he attempted a second stop, he was pulled over by a motorcycle policeman and arrested for speeding at 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile per hour zone and forced into a police car. Now this rocked King's world. Up to that point, he had enjoyed a relatively privileged, comfortable, and hap happy life, even if it was within the confines of the segregated black middle class. He had never been arrested. As a black southerner, he was all too familiar with the secret and not so secret violent crimes of whites against blacks. Where would he be taken? Would he be whisked to some remote location outside the city and killed, just as 13-year-old Emmett Till had been a year earlier in rural Mississippi? King spent several hours in a jail cell, but was eventually released that same evening. Still, the pressure after six weeks was getting to be too much for him. For six weeks, King and his wife had received hateful, intimidating messages and death threats by phone and mail every day, up to seven a day. The next night, following his release from jail, as his wife and young baby lay sleeping, King answered yet another threatening phone call. And this one was particularly frightening. The caller promised to bomb his home and murder his entire family if he didn't leave Montgomery in the next three days. King was alone in the kitchen, and he recorded the incident in his autobiography, Stride Toward Freedom. Gripped by overwhelming fear and staring at a coffee cup before him on the table, he began searching for a way to back out of the circumstances he found himself in. He wanted to quit, and he scoured his brain to discover how he could ease away from leadership of this protest diplomatically in a way that wouldn't undermine the sacrifices so many had already made, in a way that would protect his family, and in a way that wouldn't make him look like a coward. In desperation, King turned to the God he had studied and preached about, but only up until that time in a very academic and formal sense, according to 
his own words. So King told God out loud, quote, the people are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without courage and strength, they too will falter. Well, King reported that he heard within him the following answer. And again, I'm quoting from his book. I, res I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced him before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. That encounter was definitive for King, despite the fact that his home would be bombed, that his father would practically order him to leave Montgomery and return to his native Atlanta, where there was a perfectly fine church waiting for him, that he would continue to receive death threats, and he would be accused of being a communist, of being subversive and anti-American, that he would be the object of jealousy from many other movement organizers, and that he would be ridiculed by an emerging, more militant group of freedom struggle activists. Despite all of these things, King never faltered again. He remained committed to the cause of racial equality by nonviolent means until his death. And this morning, you and I are the beneficiaries of that commitment. So ladies and gentlemen, Martin Luther King's life speaks to us today about the power of transformative moments. That is the legacy I want us to consider as we leave this breakfast commemoration. We will all face them or have faced them. Those times when we see our personal responsibility to step up to a higher level, to face a particular injustice that we have been tolerating all along or ignoring all along or cowering under in some way. That moment when we have to admit to our fear, our fear perhaps of conflict, or our preference for an easier course. But that moment too, when we realize that all the stakes are too high for an easy retreat. That moment requires an unshakable stand. If we take Martin Luther King Jr. as our model, our transformative moments will be geared towards three main causes. Racial justice over racial discrimination and prejudice, peace and nonviolence over warfare, brutality, force, bullying, and physical cruelty, and economic justice over greed and economic inequality. Look for your personal transformational moments regarding these issues. Such moments will be different for each of us, but they will be unmistakable. Embrace these moments and march through them courageously knowing that all that is good in history supports you. Go forward using all that life has taught you, all the intellectual, social, personal, spiritual, political, and material assets you may command, marshalling all of your preparation to that point as did Martin Luther King Jr. and fight the good fight until the finish. Thank you very much. Dr. Like Myra Young Armstead, ladies and gentlemen, Bard College. I'd like to uh, ask you to uh, turn your attention to the video screens. We have two uh, the Congress. Uh, Congress representatives uh, Joseph Kennedy and William Keating sent uh, brief greetings, and then we'll have our benediction and uh, con conclude the day with uh, we show the day with uh, we. Good morning, I'm Congressman Bill Keating, and I'm sorry that I can't be there today to to join you, but I'm honored to be able to send this message as we celebrate the life of a great American. Dr. King's messages of hope and calls for equality are some of the most eloquent and well-known of all American speeches. His words and his life's work continue to inspire millions every day. This year, more than other years, was marked by the civil rights movement that Dr. King embodied as we saw numerous states, numerous states in our country take huge steps towards securing marriage equality for all of our citizens. This progress 
has brought us that much closer to a union where everyone is truly equal. Our work is not done, but we're moving in the right direction. And we have Dr. King to thank for inspiring the struggle, giving hope to millions, and setting our country on the path to a brighter future for all. Hi, everyone. I'm disappointed not to be able to share this day with you at BCC, but I want to thank you for the kind invitation, for allowing me to say a few words here, and for taking the time to recognize such an important day. For me, the most remarkable thing about Dr. King was the amount of faith he had in this country, despite every reason for doubt. His unwavering belief in our better angels remains a testament to the incredible reservoirs of potential he knew existed in each of us. And remembering a man whose bravery knew no bounds, we look for what is bold within ourselves, for our own capacity to make history, even if our own stories never make the textbooks. Dr. King understood that capacity. He knew that the content of this nation's character is defined less by the moments of individual action than by those fateful times when our experiences collide, where our stories meet. He was a poet and an orator who knew that words without an audience were only words, no matter how poignant. The dream he so powerfully outlined on that hot August day in 1963 would have mattered little had it not been for the hundreds of thousands of brave believers in that crowd, ready to take his message back home to their own streets, cities, and towns where it mattered most. The night Dr. King died, my grandfather took to the microphone to confront a nation brought to its knees by shock, by anger, and by grief. From his own broken heart, he urged the country to, quote, understand and to comprehend and replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that has spread across our land with an effort to understand, compassion, and love. Let us rededicate ourselves, he said, to make gentle the life of this world. Today, we are as interconnected as we are interdependent. As Dr. King pleaded with this country to understand, we are each other's strength and sorrow. And that simple fact bears tremendous responsibility. So today, we take extra care of those we love. We show extra compassion to those who need it most. And we remember a man who found grace and kindness in this country's darkest hours. Most importantly, we pledge to live up to the faith that he put in each one of us. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the day. Congressman Joseph Kennedy, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'd like to invite Rabbi Mark Elber and Cantor Shoshana Brown to uh, deliver our benediction. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. First, I want to just say that I'm honored to be here and to offer this benediction. Martin Luther King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Early in the Bible, when Adam and Eve become fully human, after eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and try to hide from the presence in the garden of Eden that they understood to be God, the Eternal One asks, Ayeka, where are you? This is a comparable perennial question. Where are we in our lives? What are we doing for tikkun olam, for repairing the brokenness of the world? Are we seeing our fellow humans as created B'Tselem Elohim in the divine image and treating them with the respect and dignity that each person deserves? As the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. faced the daunting challenges of his time with great courage and vision, may we also be able to be present and face the great challenges of our times and always draw inspiration from his unforgettable example. Amen.
Anima Amin, Anima Amin, Anima Amin, Be'amun Ashlema, Be'amun Ashlema, Oh, 